Hi, my name is Jorge and I'm a postdoc at the Jocelyn Diabetes Center, Harvard Medical School. I'm Erin, I'm a postdoc at Boston University. And I'm Sarah, I'm an administrator at Boston University. I'm so glad to join you all. Case studies are my favorite. So what does inclusion look like? What does it mean to you? Uh, it looks, I, mean, I think it looks different to different people. And for me, it looks like a welcoming environment when you are trying your best to be open about identities and cultures. Your best, it doesn't mean that it, it's always going to be successful, but you're trying your best. Yeah, I think an inclusive workspace is a space where you can be like authentically yourself in while you're doing your science or while you're writing your papers or having conversations. Like it's a place where um, you don't have to hide parts of yourself or things that are important to you. Like there's the, an expectation of sort of a give and take and you're sharing and you're learning from each other. And in, in those sorts of spaces, people do slip up. Um, and so a space where you, you know, take responsibility when you mess things up and then you learn from it and do better and improve and avoid making the same mistakes yeah. the next time and don't, you know, fall back on, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm still learning. But you continue to try to improve the ways that you interact with a variety of people. I totally agree. I think research environments are quite uh, mixed and that's the beauty of it, that they have different cultures, different identities. Having all of them doesn't necessarily make it inclusive. It, ne it requires some work and that uh, dialogue, openness, welcoming is quite necessary. And I think for new postdocs that are interviewing in these spaces, kind of seeing the signs of, of the proactiveness. Is there a welcome to my lab letter? Or when you go out to lunch with the people in the group, what's it like? And um, you know, how curious are they about each other and, and how do they interact? I think can be a great way to understand is this somewhere where I could potentially feel welcomed in, in an open space? I think too often in these interviews, we think about inclusion from the perspective of, will my expertise be included in some aspect of the scientific work? And that's prioritized kind of far above some of these other things. But um, yeah, I, I agree. I think you could look for that work. Um, yeah. And I don't think it necessarily has to be like a kind of squishy, touchy-feely sort of space to still be inclusive. Like I think, you know, you have PIs who are really like, here we, you know, we do our research and we get out. But like, I think even within a really like kind of cut and dried science driven space, you can still build in, you know, flexibility and ways to include people. So things like not always having your like happy hour right at a bar or having, you know, breakfast conversations instead of going out after the, you know, working day or things like that. Like there are ways to build into um, still a really like kind of, um, I don't know, less personal and less interrelation means be space, um, these ideas of including. Yes, I, and I think it comes back to the same thing. It's, it's never perfect, and it always comes from a place of uh, making those mistakes and always having the opportunity of those mistakes uh, becoming a learning experience where you uh, are constantly learning to be inclusive in a way, and that's what I think it's inclusiveness. Well, Nick, to me, I loved what you said about authenticity. I mean, for some people, authenticity is keeping things pretty professional. And um, for some people, it's about sharing who they are completely and transparently and, um, you know, blurring the line between that professional and personal space. And so to me, a truly inclusive environment is where both sets of colleagues can interact in a way that's respectful mm -hmm. and um, and mindful of what makes everyone feel comfortable. And so. Yeah, I think that's a huge, the authenticity piece is everything. Yeah. Let's think about what are some of the key things that we need to take into account when we think about these two scenarios. Um, maybe Jorge, you first. I think multicultural environments uh, is quite a thing here. Um, inclusion. Um, we also need to think about uh, how we can alienate at the same time uh, people when we don't welcome them to our environments. Yeah, I think those are some of the kind of the most salient issues. Well, and I think I was really struck by what you said around alienation and when when you said that it made me think about intent versus impact. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. we often intend to be inclusive in these spaces or we think we're being inclusive, but then behind the scenes someone is feeling totally differently and so I think some of the things we'll talk about here, what are some strategies to know what you don't know? Right. Um, how do you find out? Um, this case focuses on social interactions, so mm -hmm. not necessarily what's happening 
at the bench. Tell me a little bit about your spaces. What types of things do you all see? Well, in, in my lab, for example, now we have people that are from the same country, so similar situation can happen. I have a lab mate as well that is from my same country. And sometimes we do talk over coffee as well uh, in our language, and we just discuss uh, what to do next. Uh, just we feel comfortable doing it in Spanish rather than English. So we try to avoid doing it in the lab while everyone is around because we feel that, I mean, even if we just mentioned pipetting or 96 well played uh, in English, then then someone will understand it's like, oh, what are they talking about? Or if we mention <laughs> someone's name, mm -hmm. oh. it can be like, oh, are they talking about me? I mean, if just someone is passing and then they hear their name, I they think it can be quite disrespectful. So we have to be very mindful about those situations and it can be the other way around. We can have people from uh, those same cultures and languages and countries that they start uh, speaking about science or about stuff in the lab and then suddenly you realize that they also mention a keyword of your project and it's like, yeah. I wonder if they're stealing my project. Which is <laughs> not something that you want to feel in a lab environment that should be welcoming and inclusive. Yeah. I, um, my lab is a lot less bench science based, but um, and so there are, people tend to work more independently, but one place where there's been some tension is in sort of communication styles and in the ways that you interact with the professor, the, the PI and you know who who feels like they have they're like entitled to time with the professor or, um, so there's been some conflict in, in sort of approaches to the ways that you, begin doing your science or the ways that you start conversations with people and who feels like they have the right to have those conversations and when. And so one thing that's been really helpful to kind of mitigate those is having really clear sets of expectations about, you know, what the procedure is to, you know, if you need to meet with a PI or you need to meet with a postdoc or, or and um, like having things stated really clearly has helped sort of clarify some of the places where you've had issues. Yeah, and in both of these cases, the PI is central. So in the first case, the PI is kind of embroiled. And then, you know, in the second case, um, you know, the PI has an opportunity to take action, but, but doesn't. And so we can unpack, um, I think, the postdoc being in such a transition phase where you're a leader in, in the eyes of, of some folks in your research group, but then also you are still um, being mentored by this faculty member and there's a power dynamic there that can make it hard to to intervene so i'm glad you brought up the pi piece because i yeah. think that is present in both of these cases here 